All right. I almost feel like we need a stretch break a little bit. So if you want to just like move your arms around a little bit. Everybody's been sitting for a couple hours. Um, well, thanks for this opportunity. And um, I'd like to introduce myself and my organization briefly. Um, I'm David Kenny. I'm the executive director at Virtue Lab. We're a 10-year-old nonprofit organization that invests in and supports startup companies that are working to solve significant environmental challenges with innovative technologies. We've been around for 10 years, and you may remember us as Oregon Best. We just changed our name this year to Virtue Lab. We're delighted about supporting the third year of Ben Venture Conference's impact track and the role that we played in helping to start this track three years ago. Uh, a little bit about Virtue Lab. We've been a pioneer in program-related investing, which is the term used to describe a model in which nonprofits can deploy funds as debt or equity instead of versus, via grants to achieve their nonprofit program goals. And we've, uh, since 2011, we've deployed $7 million through that type of activity, um, the majority of that in the form of early stage equity investments in about 50 startup companies. And those companies have gone on since then to secure over $100 million more in capital, mostly from private sources. Um, and those companies also now employ over 400 people, um, many in middle income manufacturing types of jobs, some of the most needed jobs in our economy. At Virtue Lab, our primary programs are focused in two areas, capital and in support. In the area of capital, we make our own early stage investments. We also help companies pursue non-dilutive federal dollars via the SBIR and STTR grant and contract programs that 11 different federal agencies sponsor. And we also connect our startup companies to the national network that we've developed of angel, VC, and corporate investors um, and, and help match make and figure out what's a good fit and what stage of readiness the companies are for having those connections. Um, on the support side of things, we are a significant resource for startup companies seeking to make a major environmental impact with their new technologies. And each year, we jointly run with the Clean Tech Alliance the Cascadia Clean Tech Accelerator, a four month long program that provides curriculum, mentoring, and visibility and exposure to a cohort of startups from around the Northwest. We provide paid internships for university students at startup companies, and we provide coaching and mentoring in a variety of business and technical areas to the startup companies we work with. Looking forward, we're on the verge of launching a fundraising effort to fill an impact fund with philanthropic capital that will allow us to grow and expand geographically our own investing activities. If you're interested in learning how your impact investing strategy can intersect with your philanthropy, or how your philanthropy can leverage market forces to help scale significant environmental technologies, we'd love to talk to you more about that. Again, we're happy to be a partner of this uh, impact track this year, and I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, who I want to make sure has made it into the room so I don't have that embarrassing thing where she, she just walked out to get mic'd up. So I don't know if she's here yet. I'll speak slowly. I'll ready when you are. You're here. Okay, <laughs> good. I was looking for you for the back. Sorry, Bri. <laughs> no worries. All right. Um, so um, Brianna DiGiamarino is the Senior Director of Social Innovation at Indiegogo. She actively raises awareness about the value and best practices of crowdfunding for social entrepreneurs and has worked on multi, multiple multi-million dollar campaigns to bring financial capital to social causes. Before Indiegogo, Brie was the senior associate at the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation and an associate consultant at the Bridgespan Group, which is the nonprofit arm of Bain and Company. She's turned her trip here into a family affair. I learned in talking to her briefly that her husband is Matt Flannery, who was just on stage here for the last couple of hours. Um, and uh, he's originally from Portland and they had uh, uh, brought their child along. Uh, they're expecting another child in a few months, and uh, grandparents are here as well. So it's a family family visit to Bend. Um, Bree's going to share with us the power of crowdfunding in the social entrepreneurship space, and I'm really looking forward to her talk. And so, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Bree. I work at Indiegogo, where we bring ideas to market with crowdfunding. It's actually a real treat to be in Bend because a lot of the products that I have worked with and some of the companies that I have had some of our biggest campaigns with are featured in the stores right along um, this main area. So I feel very like-minded with what's going on in Bend. 
At Indiegogo, our mission is to empower people to unite around ideas that matter to them and together make those ideas come to life. Uh, crowdfunding isn't new. This is an idea that has been around for centuries. We like to share this example of the Statue of Liberty. When it was given to us as a gift, uh, the base was not included. So in order to have the base of the Statue of Liberty, um, Joseph Pulitzer actually put in his paper in the 1880s a call for the population to come forward and contribute so that we had a place to put the statue. And this was very successful. Over 100,000 people donated mostly pennies in order to raise more than $100,000 at the time, which of course, is today millions, um, to build the base of the Statue of Liberty. But today, crowdfunding is in a whole new era as our social networks, our financial systems, our uh, internet exists and connects everybody in a new way. So at Indiegogo, which was founded back in 2008, we see a huge diversity of projects that people are bringing to life on the site. And what we mean by that is that they are putting their idea up for the world, activating their closest communities, and then activating even broader communities to give them funds and to share their ideas and thoughts together to uh, move forward their projects. So just to be clear, the finances that are going to these campaigns on Indiegogo are contributions. They are a gift from the people backing the campaign. And they're often getting in return a perk, a token of thanks that the company or entrepreneur is offering, um, but they're not getting any kind of debt structure or equity in the company in our traditional campaign model. So uh, at Indiegogo, we have grown uh, a ton since that founding in 2008. We now have campaign owners and contributors in pretty much every country and territory around the world, including many in Bend, Oregon. I did a little look before uh, coming here today. It's everything from distilleries to creative projects. Um, and what we have found over the 10 years is that really crowdfunding is a particularly strong way to bring products to market. Uh, and this is because, yes, you can raise funds through crowdfunding, and that money piece, uh, at least when I started at Indiegogo, almost six years ago now, was usually the main reason entrepreneurs would come to us. They would say, I need 50K in order to do my first production run, or I need 100K. Um, now they're saying, uh, sometimes that's the main reason they're coming to Indiegogo, but more and more, actually, it's that uh, they might already have the funding they need, but they want to engage their audience, and they want to build that engagement, and they want to learn from their audience so that they can actually build a better product when they go to market. So as the social innovation person, I've been thrilled with the evolution at Indiegogo to see that people are using it more and more to make products that are a better fit right away so that there's less waste in that process of creating products and ultimately a better and more efficient and effective product uh, comes to the market. Um, over the past few years we've actually seen huge growth in uh, direct-to-consumer retail everywhere. And Indiegogo is playing an important role in that process by enabling that direct-to-consumer conversation to happen earlier and more effectively than ever before. So at Indiegogo, to help with that process, we are working with entrepreneurs at every stage of their production. So it's before their campaign, even before they go live with their campaign on Indiegogo, then working with them during the campaign itself, and once they hit their goal, actually enabling them to continue to raise funds through what we call in-demand, and ultimately, when they have their product, enabling them to experience a more traditional e-commerce experience with our marketplace, where they can guarantee shipping and make sure their backers get their product right away. And then what we're finding is many entrepreneurs and companies actually go through this whole cycle again and release additional products or upgraded versions of their product as they have learned from their campaigns. Um, to really help our entrepreneurs, we have a lot of uh, pieces in place, not only an amazing product that has unique features like secret perks and backend data analytics and uh, referral contests so you can know who in your community is referring folks. So you just get all of this rich data during your campaign that um, you wouldn't have gotten in an old model. Like you might have uh, expected a company to run a focus group, right, to say, hey, would you buy this product? Would you pay for it? Um, today we're actually seeing, are they paying for it? Who knows uh, if they would or say they would, but we actually see if they do. So the value of that uh, data is very, very rich for entrepreneurs and companies. 
We also have a campaign strategist team who works really closely with campaigners to help them to put together the best campaigns and learn from that experience as they go through. And over time, have really also put together partnerships in the industry. So we work with folks like Arrow to provide our campaigners access to the digital products and pieces that they need to go into their products, and also verify that they're going to be able to do what they say they want to do, because creating these products is not actually always easy. So having a company like Arrow that has done it many, many times as an advisor is a huge help. Similarly, we partner with Ingram Micro, and they help to make sure that our campaigners are able to deliver their products. We have, at this point, uh, millions of backers around the world, and that shipping component of a lot of the campaigns can be a real challenge. But working with Ingram Micro, who, again, is an established, um, experienced company in the shipping space, can be a really, really big help. So what I want to do now is actually walk you through a few examples of uh, really fun campaigns in the social innovation space. And when I'm talking about a campaign in social innovation, historically I worked with a lot of nonprofits and charities. Um, today, more and more, as we're seeing this direct-to-consumer value, I'm working more and more with social enterprises. And that means either that they are inherently impactful, maybe it's a health product or an education product, or it's that they're bringing impact into their business line, using recycled materials in the creation of their product, or hiring people who are historically hard to hire, or giving a portion of uh, proceeds to charities, this sort of uh, social innovation um, brought, brought right into their business line. So I want to share with you a few examples of campaigns along these lines. Lisa Curtis, she's an awesome entrepreneur from the Bay Area. She was a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, Africa. She started to experience the early signs of malnutrition, and her host community said, hey, why don't you try the moringa berry? She didn't know this berry, but she started to eat it and immediately felt a lot better. So she realized there was an opportunity to empower the growers of the moringa berry in Niger and other countries around the world, as well as to bring this amazing, valuable product back to the US domestic market. So she ran her first Indiegogo campaign to raise $50,000 to her first full production run. It was during this time that Whole Foods saw her work and invited her to be part of their stores in the Bay Area. She was so successful both in the campaign, as you can see, but also in Whole Foods that she was able to then go on and raise funds uh, on a second campaign to bring her second product to market, which is a, an energy shot made of the moringa berry. For this Indiegogo campaign, she raised over $100,000. And after that, she was actually able to uh, be in Whole Foods around the whole country, and most recently closed around of, uh, I want to say it was about three to four million dollars from the VC arm of Kellogg's. So she is off and running on her way. Uh, probably you've seen them in stores around here, but now keep your eye open and you'll know uh, Lisa Curtis's story behind it. Another really fun example of a multi-time Indiegogo campaigner, actually a campaign team. The mate is a collapsible electric bike from two Danish entrepreneurs, a brother-sister pair. They ran their first Indiegogo campaign a few years ago and raised over $6 million on their campaign to bring their first bike to market. Then they learned a ton from their community. Their backers were sending them comments, were asking them questions, they were getting reports from their backers in the field, and they realized they had an opportunity to make an even better electric bike. So just a couple months ago, they released the Mate X, which is their newest version of the bike, more powerful, longer lasting, uh, more durable tires, and as you can see, it raised, actually it's now over $13 million as it has continued to raise funds on Indiegogo. So this, this team, this pair, um, going direct to consumer, has raised more than $19 million on Indiegogo and really started a revolution in electric biking. Cotopaxi, this is one of the companies that I'm seeing in a lot of the stores around here. It's a B Corp. They are an awesome company who brings impact into their business line and products in many ways. Uh, they give back to communities. They hire people around the world in places who don't always have jobs. They use recycled materials in the creation of their products. They are a more established company. This was not their first product coming to market with Indiegogo, but rather they wanted to build momentum with the release of this new 
travel pack that they had, and they wanted to activate their community, but then build on it by activating the Indiegogo community and learning from their backers what was working, what was interesting uh, with this bag before they brought it through their traditional routes. So this B Corp campaign, um, this Cotopaxi campaign raised 1.3 million. Um, this was actually just one of several campaigns that Cotopaxi has run on Indiegogo, and they continue to think through what are those interesting new products that we'd want to product market test on Indiegogo and build excitement around through this channel. And then finally, I wanted to share a campaign by an even bigger company. So Lego, of course, we probably all know and knew since we were kids. Um, Lego recently joined us on Indiegogo to gain product market insight into their newest line of product, which is Legos for adults. And they call this the Lego Forma. It's a uh, fish that you can build. They have different skins, a shark skin, a uh, koi fish, uh, four different types. And you can see the quote here, which I love, which was that they really wanted to pilot this product before doing a full global release to make sure it was something the world wanted and to iterate on it before they released it fully. So this campaign is a little interesting. Uh, their main goal was to have 500 units, 500 perks uh, claimed. Um, the campaign is still live. You can go grab your Lego Forma for, um, I want to say at $85, you get the full pack. Um, and you know, they've had more than 5,000 of these claimed so far. So maybe this is the beginning of uh, Legos for adults, which we will soon see uh, all around. So I wanted to highlight, just because we're at the social impact aspect piece of the uh, conference, why I think crowdfunding is a particularly good option for social entrepreneurs. We have found through research that backers contribute to crowdfunding campaigns for four main reasons. They care about the people who are running the campaign or those who are benefiting from it. They care about the product itself, what they're getting back. They care about the purpose, the impact that campaign is having on the world. And they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And some campaigns can be really successful if you just focus on one of these. I think the most uh, high potential campaigns actually combine multiple aspects of these reasons. And social enterprise campaigns often have more than one of these reasons. And I think that's why uh, crowdfunding is such a special fit for this kind of campaign. On another aspect of social impact that makes me excited about Indiegogo is how crowdfunding is democratizing access to capital. So campaign owners on Indiegogo, as I mentioned, are from all over the world and no longer uh, do you have to be in Silicon Valley in order to be reaching investors now. Anybody can be a supporter in your campaign. Um, and also 39% of Indiegogo entrepreneurs are female. This is, of course, in comparison to the 2% of VC funding that we saw go to female founders in 2017. Um, on Indiegogo, actually, the female entrepreneurs are about 30% more successful in hitting their goals than their male counterparts. So uh, there you go. <laughs> but it's not without work. So I did want to pause and just talk a little bit about how a campaign owner brings a great campaign to market. Maybe you will be a campaign owner one day or advise somebody. Um, and also, I think some of these ideas and tools are helpful for raising funds more generally. So I found that it really boils down to three main things. You want to have a clear pitch, compelling content, and strategic outreach. So we'll just talk through each of those uh, briefly. In terms of the pitch, the first thing you want to do is have a goal of amount of funding that you want on the page and the story behind that. Now, as I mentioned, it's not always the dollar amount that's the driving factor for folks who launch a campaign, but having some logic behind that is important. And actually, it's not necessarily saying the big amount that you want, but rather starting with the smallest amount that is reasonable and useful to you. And that's because of this green bar effect, as we have found. So even though both of these uh, funding amounts are $5,000, and both of them have had the same number of backers and the same number of days left, which one of them looks more interesting to you? Almost everyone would say the bottom one. And this is because it has more what looks like momentum, because it's raised more than 30% of its goal. And we really find that 30% is a tipping point. So we really encourage campaigners to aim to hit 30% of the, their goal from people who already know and love them, uh, before they start blasting their campaign to the world because somebody who is new to their page, new to their campaign, is unlikely to back it if it's less than 30%. So you need to get 
friends and family, that email list of people who have already said they want to know about your product when it goes live, they know your brand. Get those people in at first before you aim to get uh, new folks to your campaign in. At the same time, you want to have reasons behind your goals. So uh, you can start with that low goal and say the first amount we need in order to get our first production run, say, is the 20K. But then once you hit it, you can announce on your page, if we raise 30K, we'll also be able to do X, Y, Z. This was a fun campaign to show um, a fake politician's campaign and actually engage in this campaign to expose campaign finance corruption. So these are sort of a fun set of stretch goals that this campaign released over time to get their politician, Honest Gill, on the road. Um, but as you can see, they ultimately were able to hit multiple stretch goals here and uh, raise far more than their initial goal on the page. So once you have that clear pitch, that clear ask of what you're aiming to do and why people should care, then it's time to put together your content to share that with the world. So the first thing uh, I would say is have a video. It uh, is very valuable to have a video. Campaigns with them raise much more than those who don't. But it really needs to be concise and authentic and feel personal. So uh, in the first 30 seconds, really in the first 20, Share who you are, what you're doing, and why people should care. It should have that personal touch and also communicate your product and any uh, key reasons why people should care about it. Beyond that, you can go into more specifications of the product, what are the features of it, more about your background, why are you credible, what stage are you at, etc. But nonetheless, it should always uh, be under three minutes in length. So I wasn't sure at this point if I was going to pause and actually show a video, but then I was walking down the street and I saw the Who Gives a Crap uh, toilet paper in one of the stores right down the road. And they were the reason I joined Indiegogo because I saw their campaign and I thought something special was happening and I should be part of it. So I'm going to pause and show you their campaign video because it's really fantastic. <laughs> I'm Simon Griffiths, co-founder of Who Gives a Crap. We reckon every trip to the bathroom should be a feel-good experience. So we've spent the last two years developing the only toilet paper that delivers one every time. Who Gives a Crap? It's a breakthrough on so many levels. Let me take you through them. It's better for the environment, and we've cut the nasties, so it's better for your body. That feels good. But unlike other recycled toilet paper, we're all about comfort. So it has a beautiful fluffy texture and low PTR or poke through rate. That feels good. You can choose to buy it off the shelf or have it home delivered. Either way, it costs the same as other brands, but comes with 1200% more puns. That feels good. But here's where we're really on a roll. 50% of our profits go to sanitation projects in the developing world. You see, while a trip to the bathroom can be the ultimate feel-good experience for some, for many, it's not, because 2.4 billion people don't have access to a proper toilet. The bad stuff ends up in waterways, causing diseases that fill half the hospital beds in the developing world. That doesn't feel very good. And that's why we're donating 50% of our profits to WaterAid. WaterAid helped the world's poorest people access clean water, sanitation, and hygiene education. They're literally saving the world from the bottom up. It's as simple as that. We take something that everybody needs and use the proceeds to help people in need. And that feels really good. Heading up Who Gives a Crap, Jehan Ratnatunga in LA, Danny Alexander in New York, and myself down in Melbourne, Australia. We're engineers and product designers who in 2010, through a shared passion for humanitarian aid and toilet humor, developed a business model that grabbed a lot of headlines and won a bunch of awards for entrepreneurship. We're busting to press go on the first production run and create Who Gives a Crap's first edition. Our feel-good toilet paper needs a feel-good price. And for that, we have to order in bulk. But we need $50,000 to make that happen. Basically, we need toilet paper. And like anyone who's waiting for toilet paper, we need someone to help us out. We're asking for your support. We need $50,000 to fill our warehouse with the first bulk order of Who Gives a Crap. And I won't be leaving this toilet until we've raised enough for our first order. I'm sitting down for what I believe in, and I'm not getting up until I've got some toilet paper. 
$50,000 worth. Till then, you can jump on our website and see me sitting right here on our live feed. So please, bit of help. <laughs> <laughs>So Simon, the entrepreneur, says he had to actually sit on the toilet a little longer than he wanted in order to raise the funds because he did live stream himself sitting there until he hit 60K. Um, but not only did he raise the money, he also had insight into where all of his backers were from around the world. And as an Australian entrepreneur uh, with a team in the US considering a global impact product, he, he actually was at a point of deciding where to uh, focus his work initially. So seeing that backer data and where the backers were from was really helpful for him in determining uh, where to start his work. Um, I think he told me at one point that he s saw people from around the world were all watching the video, um, but it was the Australian market who was really backing it. So he did initially work there, but clearly um, they've come to the US and um, at this point have um, continued to be very successful and expand globally and their impact uh, has been instrumental uh, for water aid and, and sanitation efforts more generally. So that was just a great example of a video. The folks here are the brother-sister pair behind the mate videos. I would also recommend both of those to check out um, if you're thinking about putting together a video. I love uh, you know, just seeing their faces and the direct conversation with their audience, um, as well as how well they go into what the product does and why people should be excited about it. So video. Then the next thing to think about is your text. And actually, you want to have a lot of the same content you had in your video in your text, because not a lot of people will look at both. Uh, so you want to be able to share, again, who you are, what you're doing, and why people should care really right away, um, get to the point quickly, and then go into more information about your product, your team, your social impact, ideally through visuals, because we find that people will often jump from image to image on the page rather than read long blocks of text. So this is the Mate uh, bike, and you can see that they've done a nice job of showing the product and then having around it uh, in relevant places the key features of that bike that make it so exciting. Um, I also see people use infographics to show their team. You can have your images of your team members. You can have your timeline for the creation of your product up through delivery. Uh, you can show your budget, your social impact. All of these can be effectively communicated through uh, infographics. Actually, a good campaign to check out right now that just launched earlier this week is the Pico by Waybe, which is creating a new child travel car seat, which I would have loved coming up from San Francisco with a two-year-old, that is very lightweight, made from aluminum. One of the founders, or one of the uh, former CEOs of Patagonia is on the founding team for this company. It's raised over 200K in the first three days of being live, and they do a really nice job, uh, both with their video and um, their text as well, so a good one to check out. Perks, so perks are those tokens of thanks that you offer to backers in exchange for their contribution to your campaign. Again, number one thing is to have perks. A lot of times it's a product that you're releasing through the campaign, so that will be a clear perk that you'll wanna offer. Um, you might wanna have different bundles of it, like a VIP version that offers additional products in conjunction with your main product. A lot of times people will offer an early bird product to get some of those earliest backers and offer them a discount on the product for that early bird perk. Um, we do find that around the $25 mark is the most frequently contributed level, though the $100-ish perk generates the most revenue. Uh, but of course, throughout, you want to keep fulfillment in mind. Um, we had the Solar Roadways campaign, which was looking to show a whole new way of having roads and um, making them smart and use energy effectively and communicate with people on the road. Um, that campaign was so exciting that it ended up raising a couple million dollars, and uh, they had many, many, many perks to deliver because they hadn't put maximums on some of their perks. So I recall them saying they were uh, up all through the night filming thank you videos to some of their backers because they had promised us at one of their perk levels. So you can have maximums available and keep that fulfillment in mind. But really, I love per perks because you can be so creative. This uh, image is of Mission Cheese, which is a San Francisco-based uh, restaurant. And they are... Uh, 
offering the backers the chance to help them create this uh, shop. And if you look closely, you can see that the sheep fur is actually made up of their backer names. So you had the chance to have your name on their wall in the sheep. Uh, so people can go and look for their name, and it's a, just a fun experience. And then finally, uh, though it's the last area I'll talk about, it's extremely important. It's thinking about your outreach plan. And really, your outreach plan starts very early. So you want to start thinking about how you will communicate your campaign and with who uh, way before you launch your campaign. We find that uh, email converts better than any other source of traffic. Um, this is probably because we don't track in person and telephone calls. So I would say with your uh, very, very close community, those friends and family, especially anyone who you think might be one of your larger backers and in the social impact space, I often do see people who are willing to put in larger investments because they care so much about the purpose. I would get on the phone with them, I would take them for coffee and I would ask them and say, would you be willing to be one of my earliest backers and show as a symbol of your support uh, to the world that um, your investment is, is important and others should join you in it. So it's a great way for people to catalyze their investment by acting uh, early and making that gift early so that others can then join them and get you to that closer to that 30% mark. And then um, definitely email is very, very important. A lot of times our campaigners will run ahead of their campaign a pre-launch initiative, which is an option on Indiegogo. You can launch a pre-launch page that's an email collection page, or you can do it on your own site. But build that email list because uh, that is really what you should rely on to get you to that first 30%, um, which will then help you to get uh, newer backers to your community. And only really after you've hit that first 30% is it a good time to go to social media. And on social media, we tend to find that Facebook converts better than other uh, social media networks, but use the networks that you have a presence on because you're activating your community uh, to come and then they will share the word and get the word out to secondary networks, friends of friends, um, and then ultimately lighter touch people. Once you've hit that level, that's a good time to go to updates. This is where you post on your campaign um, updates about your work, about the campaign. The most successful campaigns will be posting updates every three days or so, just to keep their backers really involved. It'll trigger an email to your backers. You can ask them to share more broadly. You can announce, hey, we ha if we hit the 100K mark by the end of the week, we have a backer who will come in with a 10K gift. That sort of thing um, is really, really effective. This is also a time when it's good to start reaching out to lighter touch networks. You might do a press release. It's no longer really news to be running a campaign in and of itself, but more about the traction on the campaign and how much momentum you've got, um, you've received, as well as the uh, product or work that you're doing in and of itself. So talking with bloggers, industry folks, uh, is really great to do at this stage where you've raised 30 to 50%, but it shouldn't be the first time you talk with them. Reach out to those influencers, those bloggers, those YouTubers, anyone who knows how to drive traffic to a website early. Start that before you launch your campaign so that then once you hit that momentum, you can go back to them and they're already friendly and ready to share more broadly. You can use events. Those can um, be helpful. I would say that it's not um, something I'd rely on, but it can be a nice to have as a way to get the word out. But generally keeping up that momentum with your campaign, <coughs> excuse me, ultimately at Indiegogo, uh, we share campaigns too with our community. So we'll include campaigns in our newsletter, which goes out to millions of people around the world um, multiple times a week, as well as our social channels and various placements on our, on our site. Um, Upcoming now in the social impact space, we have Giving Tuesday coming soon. So this is a day to activate your community to do something good with their social network uh, to kick off the holiday season. And this is an initiative that was founded um, by a nonprofit back in 2012. It's grown and now millions of people around the world participate. So we'll have some really exciting campaigns in the social impact space participating in that. And we'll be sharing them in really special ways on, let's say it's November 27th this year. So. That will just be one particular um, opportunity for us to share these campaigns, but we're always sharing them in many different ways. So with that, I'm seeing a blinker to say I'm almost done, um, which is good because I'm almost on my content, but just wanted to throw out that, um, as I mentioned, we love to be supportive at Indiegogo. Our campaigners can generally be more successful if we've been able to help them and take a look at their campaign, give them feedback on it, uh, provide resources and examples to them. So please feel free to reach out 
anytime. I'm just Bria Indiegogo.com, and I'd love to be a thought partner um, with you far before you even want to launch your campaign. So thanks for having me today. So it's Q&A time for the audience, just like we did earlier. We got the catch boxes out here. Have, I have a question. Does this primarily work on B2C or it can work on B2B as well? So crowdfunding, I think, can work for any type of company. I would say that direct-to-consumer is the most obvious opportunity. So for a company that's more B2B, you have to be creative in a different way. Um, I've seen it happen, but I wouldn't say that it's um, as easy to put together. So happy to chat about it, have a think about it. You saw those four reasons why people back a campaign. So it's not, if it's not B2C, they're probably not getting a product. So you have to really make sure those other three reasons of purpose, participation, um, and people are elevated. Hi, Bree. Thanks for a great presentation. Okay. I'm curious. I don't think, just a second. I don't think we have a catch box for upstairs, or do we have a microphone up there somewhere? No. No, nope, sorry. Okay, why don't you, well, from the, from the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, so Indiegogo has always encouraged people who have impact built into their uh, campaigns to use the site. So um, yes, so the key thing is that on the back end of a campaign, all of the funds will need to go to one bank account, but then that person or um, company is welcome to disperse those funds further if they wish. So I'll often see something like, uh, you know, 30% of the perks price goes to a charity that's relevant, or it could be even a buy one, give one model. So a lot of times I'll see that in-kind contribution, like a solar light product. There's one called Quinn that's uh, live right now. It's really neat. And they give a product away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so, because that helps um, with those four, four reasons again. And if it's a product somebody wants, bringing in that purpose part can definitely uh, help tip people over the edge. Even that Waby campaign that I mentioned, the travel car seat, they are um, giving away some of their car seats to charities for people who are helping kids travel for not so happy reasons, like for medical uh, reasons or things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think having that messaging in it is quite helpful. Yeah. Can I go now? Okay, uh, Okay. Uh, my question is, as it relates to defining success of a campaign, it seems like it's actually getting the product delivered, and you didn't right. bring that up, and I know there's been some, some notorious failures on your, your platform, on Kickstarter and others, so what, what are you doing to, to increase the odds that when someone gives money to a campaign, they're actually gonna get what they expected to get? Right, right, so um, certainly as the industry of crowdfunding has evolved, we've seen many, many successes in uh, some cases where that delivery has been a challenge, especially perhaps if it's been a very successful campaign that has gotten more demand than they expected. Um, so a few things, one is that we are partnering with companies, and that's exactly why we partnered with Arrow and Ingram Micro, so that we can provide access to these supports that help them to do what they say they're going to do. Um, also, with Arrow, and we've actually brought that process into the campaign. So a campaign owner uh, can get verified by Arrow while they are live, that Arrow has reviewed their bill of materials and said, yes, we believe that this is actually going to work. It's feasible at the price level uh, that they have stated. So that verification is a badge you get on your page. Um, in addition, we actually now require campaign owners to state what stage they are at in production. So you can say it's still concept, you can say that you're a prototype, that you're actually uh, creating it, or that you are at delivery. And we verify that. So uh, that really helps backers to know how much risk they are taking on. Yeah. In the so, middle here. Uh, my question is actually related to that. Sorry, I'm back here on your right in the corner. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, so you just basically named off four stages of a product. Um, do you have a sense of where in that the most success comes or, or sort of how each of those four areas would break down? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the closer you are to delivery, the more backers will trust that you're going to be able to do what you say you're going to do. So the more likely you are to convince a higher percent of backers to contribute. Um, but that said, I would say as long as you're at 
as long as you have a working prototype and all of the images and the videos in your campaign are actually showing real products as opposed to some sort of digital rendering, um, that's going to build a lot of backer trust. Um, the other thing there is thinking about how far out you are. So we've studied this a little bit, and if you're more than about eight months out on your delivery, uh, I think we start to see some drop off in terms of um, backer conversion. But if you're within that eight month or so delivery window, then it, people understand that there's going to be a little bit of a lag in crowdfunding. So I think if you're at production within eight months of delivery, pretty good space to be. My next, I must be the mic's on. Hi, right over here. Do you provide any sort of access to consulting services where your uh, people on the search for some funding might need it, for instance, logistics consulting or other things that they may need to get their product off the ground? Yes, so we've recently created what we call the experts directory, and this is full of different agencies who help it campaigns at different stages. So we'll ha we have, for example, marketing agencies who will actually help you put together your campaign, as well as folks who will help at later stages. So I definitely recommend checking that out, and you can see the different folks uh, who are in that. And these are all companies who have worked with campaigners before, and those campaigners have shared positive reviews of them. Hi. Um, I've raised uh, thousands of dollars via crowdfunding campaigns and specifically um, I love uh, your logos, platform, and your website, and your functionality. It's like amazing. Thank you. Compared to Kickstarter, there's a common belief that um, you don't quite have the same market reach, especially in tabletop gaming and various different things like that. What I wanted to ask is, one, are you guys doing anything to compete with that and get more users to your website? And then also, are there any specific categories that are really strong on Indiegogo that you recommend to entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, so a couple years ago, uh, we really focused in on being the best site for people bringing products to market. And I think we have done that. Uh, and that is largely by building out our product. So we do have features that are not on any other site. So that includes things like the pre-launch page I mentioned, <coughs> where you can gather emails. Also the back-end data analytics, where you can integrate with Facebook and Google for digital uh, pixel integration. So you can do effective digital marketing. You get access to backer data much faster on Indiegogo, so you can run campaigns against it. Uh, just the full suite of back-end data um, information, as well as some of the tools we have available to learn during your campaign and iterate during it, like the secret perks, you can, in, you can talk with a segment of your community, like the referral data that helps you to see who is referring traffic to your campaign, so you can build a relationship with them. They might not be donating the most, but they are referring people who are contributing. So this kind of thing um, is, is exclusive to Indiegogo. We don't see these things on all the other sites, so that kind of product feature has been a big focus for us. Uh, in fact that I would say every big campaign we have helps to bring a lot of people to the site. So the fact that we had uh, you know, just a $13 million campaign has generated a lot of awareness in uh, particularly the electric bike space, but really a lot of um, any kind of product coming to market space. So I think that is building on itself, and I strongly believe Indiegogo is the best site for people bringing to products to market. Um, I actually think it's particularly good in the social impact space. Um, other sites are not, have not historically been open to having impactful campaigns, whereas Indiegogo has always welcomed that. So uh, for me, that's always been sort of the perfect, the perfect fit. But I'd say product plus our customer support and how closely we work, we work with campaigners and have that relationship with them is, is very unusual. We have time for one more question. Any questions? Okay, I guess we've got it covered. Are you going to be at the networking event tonight? Yeah, we'll Great. be stopping by. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. Big Thank round you. of applause for Bree. <laughs> okay. I will head off. That was great. <laughs>